here's an example that may fall closer to home. These are toads. And you all are familiar with toads here. And so this is a phylogeny um, that's based on a great uh, phylogeny with a lot of new data that came out in 2006 from uh, herpetologists at the American Museum. And I've coded in um, yellow with guidance from Dave all the species and the taxa that occur here in Cameroon, right? In Africa. Africa, sorry, Africa, right, good. Um, okay, so all the things that have been called toads in the genus Bufo, you can see it written in the tree here, these are all the things that, that taxonomists have in the past have called Bufo. Uh, and Bufo is the sort of generic name for toads. And they go here, and they, but these, then there's the other things that were really morphologically distinct and looked really different. So taxonomists calls them Schistoderma, Capin's Bufo, um, what else do we have here, Nectophrynoides, Didyamphus, Didyamphus. So there's some things we'll see, Didyamphus, or might see Nectophryne, uh, Wollenstorphia. Those are all things that are right around here, Western Africa, that have been um, um, that have been recognized as distinct and called separate genera because they look really different. They look really distinct, which is an, an apomorphy-based argument. It's like they are an they represent a bunch of characters that are sort of odd apomorphic because they arrive, they're derived in one lineage, but they're not shared with anything else. Okay, so you have these things that are nested within Bufo that have different names. So, Bufo, using our terminology that we've used so far, Bufo is wildly paraphyletic with respect to a bunch of these specialized, really interesting other toad genera. And so, what's the best solution? Do we lump everything back into Bufo and change all these names? Schistoderma, we change that to Bufo, so it becomes Bufo Karens. And instead of Nectophrynoides torrenti, is that what it is, Torrierii, we call it Bufo Torrierii. Um, do we lump all this stuff back into Bufo? Or do we recognize all these really distinct genera because they're really different? And then that means that the stuff in between, we have to come up with new generic names for them so that each of these named taxa are monophyletic. That's the rule, right? So we'd have to come up with a new genus name for this group of Bufo. And in this case, a taxonomist has suggested not just one separate new genus name, but three, Anaxorus, Cranopsis, and Chaunus. Um, and in this case, uh, these things have been, these ones here have been called Bufo, so we'd have to come up with a new name for them, and that has happened right here in your backyard. Amyotophrynae, right? That's the name that a lot of you know, right? That's where it fits in this whole clade. It's surrounded by things that are just called Bufo and still remain called Bufo. Um, so the solutions are either we lump everything back into Bufo or we have to come up with all these new generic names. At a minimum, you have to come up with a genus for each monophyletic clade, but in some cases you could even go further because that's your opinion and you, want to, you, know, you, you feel that they look really different and you see there's monophyletic clades in between, so you could even give those names and you could just go on and on and on. So, um, so again, what would be the best solution? for this quandary that we find ourselves in. Does anyone have any ideas? How would you choose between all the solutions, all the different things? Well, one way, and this is the way that was suggested by our colleagues, Greg Polly, who is now a, a curator at uh, Los Angeles County Museum, and David Canatella, who's a professor at University of Texas in Austin, um, was to, to total up the number of couplets of genus, species, name changes that each of the alternative taxonomies would give us. And so they took the tree and they said, okay, this, let's look at the way different things that we could call Bufo. We could call this Bufo and then lump all these things back into the name Bufo and it would create this many changes, 90 changes of genus, species, name switches. Or we could call this Bufo number three and they totaled them all up for each of these lineages. They totaled them all up and showed that this would create 83 changes of switching genus and species if we lumped everything back into Bufo at that stage. So if we called these things separate genera, but called this whole clade here Bufo, it would be 83 changes. And then all the way at the other direction, if we recognized all these previously uh, recognized genera as separate, as separate, as real gen genera, and then we named all the clades that fall between them, the things that are now currently called Bufo, and across all this tree, we looked at the number of genus species changes that would occur all the way across the tree. The answer is 217 changes. So if you are a conservative taxonomist who is trying to do, remember the, the principles of stability 
and conservativeness and trying to uh, reduce or eliminate or at least minimize confusion, which would, be the, which would be the ones that you would choose? If you're trying to be conservative here, which is a good goal, right? We shouldn't change things if we don't have to and we're looking for stability. What would you, yeah? What's that? Choose number two. Let's look at it here. So here's two. The number of changes that two would impart, which is this clade here. If we call this Bufo and recognize all this other stuff as different things, the answer is it only changes 51 genus species couplets. And so one way to make these decisions is just figure out which one results in the fewest changes. And that's a pretty defensible and I think sound way to go. You can really make that argument. I chose the alternative that, cre that creates the least amount of confusion or that makes the fewest amount of changes to the existing taxonomy and that is the most conservative thing we can do. And so that might be one solution. That would be the one that at least some people could, could make that argument. And it's a pretty, pretty cogent argument, I, I would argue. But there's all these different alternatives and they all, they all result in different things. And here's the point that I made before. Um, a specifier, again, is a species or an apomorphy or something that, re, uh, that is a reference point in the phylogeny. And what we like to use is the type species or the, the generotype or the type species for a genus to pin the names to the correct clades. And the specifier that we use is the type species of that genus to say that this is the name that sticks on that clade and so these other things might be new clades. And if we go with the specifiers of following the type species for each genus, and the fewest number of, of genus species couplet changes, we can result in a phylogeny that, a, a classification that reflects evolutionary history and phylogeny, and that results in the fewest amount of changes to the existing classification. Yes, sir. Oh, question in the back. My oh, it's over here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Ralph. My, my worry is choosing the conservative uh, side of the story. Mm -hmm. Would it not be like an attempt to run away from the <laughs> from the much work that you have to do into looking at the group that has more that has had more changes? Mm -hmm. yeah, because I think people would have done work to be able to come up with those changes, mm -hmm. and I think they have they have had uh, results mm -hmm. to be able to get to those changes. Right. Yeah. So I look at it like wanting to choose a group that has little changes as an attempt to run away from the bulk of work that you have to do to re have to reorganize back to organize things. Oh, yeah, all of mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those are the you hear those arguments a lot. Um, uh, people have people have named these other genera, the ones up in blue or in yellow there, um, um, people have named historically have named those genera because they recognize the diversity in those groups. They recognize that they are morphologically really distinct. Mm -hmm. They recognize that in some cases they're ecologically distinct. They're very different taxa. They don't do the same things that regular toads do. Maybe they're arboreal and they live in trees and they don't live on the ground. Yeah. And shouldn't we have a classification system that recognizes those really unique things and corrects everything else? And that's, that's an argument that, um, that people have made um, and continue to make. And, and your point about you know the changes have already happened, so why would we want to go back, right, I guess? That's an, ar that's, that's an argument that, um, that I really understand and I'm really sympathetic with. Um, you know, when this kind, of ch this kind of wholesale change has happened, one is tempted um, not to revert to the traditional classification because that would be going backwards, right? Going no. back in time or going back in, no? Yeah, we could still go backward to, we can go backward and it helps us to correct mm -hmm. yeah, some mistakes because going forward too doesn't mean that we are really doing the right thing. We could sure. go, yeah, we could go forward look at it and see maybe you did some kind of vague work somewhere mm -hmm. and we are forced to come back. Yeah, that's no problem. Right. Well, if, if that's the motive, then it's fine. Sure. But it shouldn't be like you are just escaping from the work that you escaping need from to the work you to, yeah, yeah. to come back to that. That's my point. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. That's my point. I get your point. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. That's definitely a good point. Yeah, these are, there's no right answer to a lot of these questions and a lot of it still is dependent on the philosophy and the opinion of the, of the, um, of the taxonomist. But one last point that I would make, if you look at that bottom clade in the tree there, and I'll just come back around, and then that, this will be my last point for this section. Um, if we focus on that last clade right here, this one here, Town's got it circled. Um, so look at that. We could name this group as one genus. It's monophyletic. It all comes from a single common ancestor, and as represented there, all the descendants of that ancestor are included. 
So that record, that that's a higher that that passes the the test of a higher level taxon. And if, if we're going to recognize these things all as separate genera, you could name that as one genus. That would be a bunch of, a bunch fewer changes right there. But notice that in this representation, um, those things have been named as three separate genera. That that choice between those two seems kind of arbitrary to me. It doesn't seem to be based on any real um, on any on any defensible choice one way or the other. And I think if you're given that choice, you know, if you if you're given that choice of having a single monophyletic group, um, and there's and they're all recognized right now as bufo, so that means they're morphologically uniform and they're all pretty much the same thing. Why don't we recognize that as one clade? Why go to the level of recognizing it as three? And you could even go further and recognize it as nine or whatever. I mean, there's, there's a point to stop, basically, is my point. And Dave has one final point to make. I just say that it's OK and expected just because of you know, the fact that groups of animals share common ancestry that within a genus, some set of species will share a trait. Mm -hmm. Just because within a genus they share a trait I mean, that, I mean, to me, is not an argument per se that it has to be yet another genus, right? right. Um, but sometimes it's used that just because, you know, for instance, some subset of species have a trait that's unique to them, that that's the reason for, you know, having these things be a genus. But, that, I mean, that's not really a necessary thing, right? That's just how evolution works. Things share exactly. traits through common ancestors. And are hierarchically arranged. and.